Good morning. It's good to see you and hear you this morning. You're all alive and well. You've traveled to worship the Lord. This word from James chapter 1, verse 12. Listen to what it says. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Our lives are not immune to the evil around us. But when evil has done its worst, God works for good. And he promises to give us rest, even in the most horrific storm that we happen to be in. Let's go to him today as we plan our spiritual journey of worship together. And let's prepare to worship. Lord, the free will you've given us the capacity, you've given to us the freedom. And yes, in the past, we've chosen the evil way. Remind us, Lord, that those paths can be redeemed by your plan for good. You can raise us up from whatever trial we're in and give us rest. Thank you for that, Lord, today in Jesus' name. Amen. Sandy? Today we're finishing our series called Turbulence. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 50, beginning at verse 15 and going through uh, 
to verse 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God, of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good against me. For God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore do not be afraid, I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I've titled this message, The Difference. The idea that there is evil in the world. And that sometimes those evil things turn to good. Between the evil and the good, there is God. Her name is Christine Kane. Five feet three inches tall. She travels over 300 days a year. Testifying before courts and councils, congressional hearings, parliament, prime ministers, and presidents. She'll just as easily stare down sex traffickers. It is her mission to stamp out those that would profit from those that have been exploited in that way. She was 30 years of age when her parents told her that she had been adopted. She had no idea. She looked up her records. She was born to a Greek mother, father unknown, according to her birth certificate. In fact, they never gave her a name. For 12 years, she was raised by a family member that repeatedly exploited her sexually. When she found out the truth, she decided she was going to go on a crusade. And she has done just that. She thought about this in concerning her life. There's a passage in Isaiah chapter 49 that she came across. Verses 1 and 2, it says, Listen to me, O islands. Pay attention, you people from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named me. He has made me a mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has concealed me. He has made me a secret arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. What I know is this. None of us, none of us is immune to evil in our lives. Hal Lindsay wrote the book, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. Boy, does that title capture the things that happen in our world. Read about a mother and a wife 
who found out about an affair that her husband was having. Didn't have a clue. Just a piece of paper in his pocket with charges, cell phone, conversations repeatedly. Threw her for a loop. Somebody that she knew and that she thought she knew and that she could trust. Everything blew up. Think about a friend of mine. He was looking for a job. Had a college education. Came across this wonderful opportunity to help people to plan for their retirement years. Worked for this company for several years called Enron. And Bernie Sanders was arrested for the scam that that was. Since the company was bankrupt, he lost his job. Lost a lot of good friends that he can try to convince to invest in that and lost a lot of money. I think about a young girl that I heard about. Raised in church. Conservative. Bright. Athletic. All kinds of opportunities. She was introduced to this young boy at a dance. Good looking. Said all the right things. They hooked up just once. She found out she was pregnant. All of a sudden, all of his loving words changed. Get rid of it, he said. She wouldn't even think about it. He said, I want no part of this. And off he went. Leaving her to face her parents, her church, her own humility. Sounds evil. But no more evil than the inventory of Bible characters that we read all the time. See, the Bible is not silent about evil. I think of Moses. Remember, when he was born, there was a new Pharaoh that didn't know about Joseph, didn't remember about Joseph. It was literally made a law that all the Jewish male children be drowned in the Nile. And Moses' parents hid him as long as they could. Put him into a wicker basket. Made it wetter tight with with tar and pitch and put it in among the reeds of the Nile. And Pharaoh's own daughter found the basket, couldn't have a child of her own, took it home in the Hebrew swaddling clothes and said, Daddy, can I have it? Sure. He's such a little thing, he won't hurt anything. Oh, his story is historic. He ended up becoming the deliverer, the exodus. I think of Daniel. Daniel, the man who was taken as a captive of Nebuchadnezzar, who defeated Jerusalem and Judah, and who found the brightest, best Jewish men to be a part of his court. He was trained in the language and the customs, and after three years he was quizzed. And he never altered his diet from the diet that the Babylonians offered him. He never changed his practice of praying three times a day to the God of the Hebrews. And he stood head and shoulder above all the other wise people from all the other lands that Babylonian had collected to be a part of his court. 
You know the story about the lion's den. That's how they got him. According to the law, they said you should not pray to anybody else but Nebuchadnezzar from now on, or for his statue. Daniel still prayed to God of the Hebrews. After he was miraculously saved from the lions, Nebuchadnezzar said, No God but the God of Daniel will be worshipped in my realm. I think of Nehemiah, another Jewish servant, a cupbearer to the king, who by this time was a Persian king and lived in Susa. When he heard about the devastation back home, he grieved, he mourned, and he prayed. When he next was in the king's presence, his king realized his troubled look. He said, what's going on? And he told him. He said, what do you want to do about it? He says, I want to go back. I want to rebuild the walls. It was not easy. You see, the neighbors around Judah did not want this to happen. They liked being able to raid all of the crops and the fields and to be able to keep the people impoverished. First, they ridiculed the building project. Then they tried to malign it to get them to stall it, to stop it. Then when that didn't happen, they tried to get rid of Nehemiah himself or to slip in among them and try to injure those who were building. Those people had a, a trowel in one side, one hand, and, and, a, and a sword in the other. But they rebuilt the wall. And Issachar, may not recognize that name, but that's one of the twelve brothers of Israel. I use that name because we don't know the name of the person who was the innkeeper when Mary and Joseph, following the Caesar Augustus law that they have to register in the ancestral birth of Joseph because they were engaged to be married. Mary was heavy with child and came to this inn in Bethlehem. Mary was very pregnant. And Issachar said, I don't have anything left. Nothing but the stable out back where Jesus was born. Well, the cross itself. Paul says the cross is offensive to the Jews and a stumbling block of foolishness to the Gentiles. But for those who are being saved, it is the power of God. In the story today, it's interesting to us, at least it's interesting to me, the book of Genesis is a story of beginnings. Adam and Eve, first family, the first homicide, civilization, the establishment of nations, the flood and the restart. And then Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Half of the book of Genesis is all about Joseph. Who when his brothers realized their dad was dead, they were still in Goshen, that we're still very possibly going to be justice served. They came to him with a plan. Just get him to promise, to pay a vow, to have mercy. And he says to them something very important as a clue to us. Am I in the place of God? What happened to me, you intended as evil. 
See, God gives to every one of us a choice. Which is why we hurt and why we have been hurt. The evil of turning our backs on someone close to us. The evil of false accusations and getting somebody in trouble. The evil of forgetting somebody who does us gracious service. The evil is there. But in the midst of the evil, there is good. Isn't it interesting that in the story of Joseph, the lowest times of his life, when he's on the auction block, when he's down in the cistern, when he's in the dungeon, it says God was with Joseph. And he's preparing him. He prepared him in the large estate of Potiphar to learn about accounting, to learn about governing, to learn about ruling and making things work smoothly. He learned just as much in the prison. How to deal with prisoners or those that were so low that despair was great. Until Pharaoh had his dream. And he emerges. He knows what the dream means. He knows what needs to be done. He carries it out. And not only is Egypt saved, but his brothers and his father are reunited. Yes, there's evil in the world. Evil that can be worked for good. Because there is God. When things were the blackest on that Good Friday, when the Jesus the Christ was raised to the sky, crucified on a cross, and the clouds drew black, and he became sins for us. And on Saturday, when everybody rested, and the body was laid to rest in this tomb, there was nothing but silence. But on Sunday, the stone was rolled away. The angels came. And when Mary and the women came, they said, He is alive. Jesus that you're looking for, He has risen as He said He would. And you will see Him. Go tell His disciples. That leaves us with an invitation. Because we know how life can go. See, we're not guaranteed, even as Christians, that there's always going to be a rose garden. There will be pain in our lives, it hurts. When there's physical suffering. It hurts when there's psychological turmoil and we don't have the money to pay the bills. It hurts when somebody turns from us or does something that hurts us. It's painful. And God isn't quick. He's not into microwave Christians. Where you can put us in there for 30 seconds and we're done. He takes whatever time it takes 
for us to get to the end of ourselves, for him to polish off the rough edges, to cut away what doesn't need to be there, internally or externally. And at the end of our lives, there's life. I've noticed some places. I had to drive over to North Vernon this past week, and I noticed that there was a place where the road had literally been carved through rock. It had piled up all these barriers to keep the soil from eroding where the road had been carved through. Retaining walls of stone poured with other rocks. And sometimes concrete poured on top of that. All kinds of weed killer. And as you look along there, there's blades of grass sticking out. Trees that are poking out. A few flowers blooming. Reminder that it doesn't matter the pressure of stones and chemicals and rock and pressure because there is God life, eternal life, abundant life still happens. The invitation is simple. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Rest in pain? Yeah. Rest when the waiting is long? Yes. Because in Jesus there is life. And that's our invitation this morning. We're going to be singing a song of decision. It's a song for us to think about when we face turbulence and a life is turned upside down. Never think God hasn't forgotten about us or that God isn't going to take that pain and rework it for his glory. Today, let's stand and let's sing our song of decision. Did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I had done, he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and I am happy all the day. Might the sun in a darkness hide and shine his glories in? In Christ the mighty Maker died for.
for man the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and I am happy all the day. The drops of grief can ne'er repay debt of love I owe. Here's Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day.